Hi, good evening. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight. I'd like to begin by thanking our panelists and also thanking Mark for organizing this tonight's discussion in conjunction with the Asia Society of Northern California. So, introductions. First, we have Barbara Pollock. She's an art writer and critic who first visited China in 2004 and has since written extensively on contemporary art from the Asian region. Her current curatorial project is My Generation. It's at the Orange County Museum of Art opening June 26. We also have Abby Chen. Abby is a curator, writer, and the deputy director at the Chinese Cultural Foundation here in San Francisco. Her upcoming project, which opens this Friday, is Present Tense 2015 Future Perfect, featuring six Asian American MFA artists from the Bay Area. And finally, we have Yan Ching, an artist based in Beijing and Los Angeles, and he is one of the 28 artists featured in the exhibition that you can see in the museum now. So the Asian Art Museum's exhibition, 28 Chinese, which came to us from the Rubel family collection in Miami, gives us this occasion to discuss facets of contemporary art in China. Don and Mira Rubel amassed this collection of 28 artists between 2008 and 2013. They took a series of five research trips to China. You might have heard of the Rubels. They're collectors of international contemporary art. They have about 6,000 works in their collection. They started looking into China about 2001. And, um, the artist Zhan Wan actually suggested to them to start following Chinese art. And so they took a trip there and they returned feeling as though they didn't quite understand fully what was going on there. They felt like what they were seeing was, as Don said, made for export. And so they decided to give it some time and then a few years later they returned to the subject in 2008. They began by researching Chinese art extensively, reading all the journals that were coming out of the region, uh, trying to get their hands around this subject the best they could from the vantage point of being in Miami, before really embarking on traveling throughout China, visiting 100 artist studios there, and ultimately collecting the work of 28 artists. So the Rubels talk a lot about their collecting practices, and they say that for them, it's really about a connection that they have with an artist. They like to visit all of the studios. They want to experience the work with the artist in the studio, hear from the artist's mouth. Their only agenda, they've said, is to share these connections with the rest of the world, to give these artists a platform to, for their, audio, their work to be seen by other audiences. And so, in collecting art from China's artist studios, the Rubels would be the first to tell you that they were not attempting to define art, to, to define contemporary art. And I think they would go so far as to say that such goals are impossible to achieve. For one thing, their travels were focused primarily in mainland China. They visited six cities there. Their 28 artists only includes two women. So looking at their collection really only offers a slice of the landscape, which obviously begs the question, what's left out? What concerns and practices and perspectives are not found among these 28? So while a, a major thread of this exhibition is about these collectors, the story of uh, these 28 artists and their personal collecting journey in China, the exhibition does also give us this opportunity to expand upon this narrative and to try to broaden the conversation about contemporary art. So that's where I would like to begin tonight. The topic of tonight's program is, of course, impossible to address in any complete way. 
So we'd like to use our panelists' perspectives as a point of departure for our conversation around Chinese art today and what that even means. So to do this, we asked our three panelists to put together presentations. Kind of, and then their, their prompting question was, what, what, are, what, what, what do you think is overlooked? What is often left out? And what is a salient feature of art coming out of China today that you would like to focus on, that you have experience with? So what we'll do tonight is start with these presentations. Each of the panelists will present a series of 20 slides that will be timed. So it's about six minutes each. And then following that, we'll have a conversation with their, you know, using these presentations kind of as a springboard. To, to conclude, we'll uh, open it up for some questions. So with that, I'd like to welcome our panelists up to the stage here, and we will get things started. So please welcome Barbara Pollack. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, Mark, and thank you, everyone at the Asian Art Museum for inviting me to speak. Um, it gave me a happy occasion to come to San Francisco where I don't visit as often as I visit Beijing. Um, I just wanted to say that um, the thing I'm gonna be looking at today is the difference between the first generation of Chinese artists that came to attention in the United States emerging mainly in the 1990s and the new younger generation that's emerging today. It's a topic I've spent a lot of time researching and thinking about, and most of my conclusions are in the exhibition, My Generation Young Chinese Artists, that's opening at Orange County Museum of Art at the end of this month. Um, but I see Mark's like, don't talk too long during the introduction, get the slide started. So. Um, for many of the artists of the first generation that emerged in the 1990s, the really, um, the uh, political event that basically informed their life experience and later their art making was the Cultural Revolution that took place in China between 1966 and 1976. I would also say that this is what most Americans thought and probably still think Chinese art looks like. When I speak around the country, most of the audiences I talk to are unfamiliar with uh, Chinese contemporary art, and they think it still looks like the Cultural Revolution, when in fact what you have is artists like Wang Guanyi, who emerged in the late 1980s, who makes work influenced by the Cultural Revolution, but also influenced by people like Andy Warhol or Zhang Xiaogang, who again is making work that you can almost trace back the look of it to family photographs taken during the Cultural Revolution, but is doing it to give his specific views on things like the one-child policy. Um, for, for the artists of that generation, Something like the Beijing East Village was one of the communities they gathered in outside Beijing in an area that now is entirely developed and within the fifth ring row. During Beijing East Village, the artists were engaged in performance art, such as this piece by Zhang Wan, photography, the beginnings of video art, and the beginnings of installation art but it still was very rooted in the Chinese experience, in the conditions that were available to them at that time. Or you saw artists like this piece by Ai Weiwei engaging with objects and artifacts from the 5,000 year old history of Chinese art, such as this piece where Ai Weiwei drops a thousand year old um, Han Dynasty urn. Or you see artists like Xu Bing working in calligraphy. I was interested in what kind of art artists who live in a city like modern day Shanghai would be making. I thought here are artists that have gone through the most rapid urbanization that we've ever seen, the most rapidly expanding economy of the 20th century, 
And so I began looking at the younger generation, those who were born already after the open door policy, who grew up with this expanding economy and have seen their families and their lives completely transform from a more rural, isolated China of the beginning of the 1980s to the 21st century superpower that it is today. Um, I saw that artists of the younger generation, first of all, were dealing with issues like the one-child policy, being products of the one-child policy themselves. Or with relationships, the whole way relationships have been reorganized now that the family is not necessarily the center of, of Chinese society. I also noticed that many of these artists were no longer feeling like they had to be tied to Chinese cultural iconography. They work in a very global, universal iconography, and they want to be understood on a global stage. Um, one of the things that united many of the artists that I saw were them dealing with things like the urbanization of their cities, such as this um, work by Lu Di, which shows almost a bizarre animal being cramped by Beijing housing units. Um, th these artists, the stereotype of artists of the younger generation is that they're spoiled little emperors, but what I found was that they were engaged in a lot of very serious issues from the environment to um, their own training as artists and the fears around succeeding as an artist to um, relationships, to new technology. This is a young woman artist in Shanghai who works in 3D animation, as opposed to the next slide. This is a little tricky with the slides going by themselves. Um, which is an artist, Liu Yang, no, Lu, Liang Yangwei, who makes art as if it looks like woven silk, but it's actually a meticulously done oil painting. There are a lot of women in the younger generation, as opposed to shows of older generation where women would almost always be completely excluded. I found it easy to have almost 50-50% in my exhibition. Um, I also found that when artists did refer back to Chinese iconography, such as ink painting, they did it in a whole new way, like Sun Shun making hand-drawn animation using ink drawing. Or, but the main stereotype of this generation is that it's apolitical, that they just go along with things as they are, that no Ai Weiwei is emerging from this younger generation. In one way that's true, but I definitely have seen that these are artists that are willing to engage in their opinion of the political situation, not just in China, but throughout the world through all different types of media. This artist performed, did as a performance running for mayor in his hometown to show the absurdity of the local elections, which are all predetermined by the Communist Party. Or this artist, Zhao Zhao, who was an apprentice to Ai Weiwei for seven years, made these pieces where he fired bullets into mirrors and glass to mimic the look of spray of bullets across windshields in Tiananmen Square. These are artists that may not be vocal on the internet the way I was, but they have a lot to say. So I just want you to, take, to begin thinking about this younger generation of Chinese artists when you think about Chinese contemporary art. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, hello, how are you? And so I want to thank first the Addison and thanks for your extraordinary, I mean, organize this show. I mean, for me, I think it's really, really wonderful to see my work in this round of me of them. And thanks, Mark, you organize this event. And before I start, I want to apologize that my English is, might be not good, so I'll try my best. <laughs> and uh, I think I'm the, uh, I, 
I was born in 1986, so I think I'm the youngest artist in the 28 Chinese. And as my generation, I don't think our most focus is on politics, but how we're going to define the politics, because we always live in this society, all things about the politics and the financial, the international affairs. But for me, I think my concern is about how I, how I create the project. So I never define myself as an artist who focus on the video or the performance or the painting or installation only. And so all my project is depends on the exhibition. Like this one is showing in Venice Panano and um, it's a perform, perform, oh my God, so fast. And this is the one that's showing in the downstairs and it's called Kill the TV Set. I inspired it by the Korean artist, Nanjong Pak. And I re-performed his um, performance with Charlotte Moorman in 1970s. And this is a video piece. So I want to discuss uh, how the technicals in the, in the work will happen. And this one is called um, Three Photos and, and uh, Two Videos and Related Masterpiece and American Art. And there's, so, um, there's seven doodles which are designed by myself on the plinth. And it's inspired by the excavation from, from South Africa. And I invited to um, two models from Kenya came to Beijing. We're shooting for this film, and it's not about only the film. It's also the uh, photograph. So it's a, quite a comprehensive project. So you could see my work is related about performatic or the theater art, but it's not just a, just that kind of the media. And so this one is called Arty Super Arty. It's a performance based uh, piece, and the. And I'm one of the performers and the actors in my piece, and inspired by the American. Our American artist, um, yeah, Edward Hopper. Sorry, yeah. And uh, I selected seven of his paintings, and I changed all the details of the original piece, and re-performed um, the performance again. So it's a video, and right now you can see it's uh, still the images from the video. And this one is called Dirty Art. It's about the discussion as how we face on the darkness or the negative motion or the, or the fear from the people's behaviors. And the original, the installation, the format um, was inspired by Edward Hopper as well for them, for the hippies. And this is called Lenny in the 1980s, and I created the show. And, but the, only, the entire exhibition is an art project called Lenny in the 1980s. It's about a story about a collector who lived in the 1980s, and this is all his collection. But it's in the first layer. And the second layer is he might be a, um, also an art historian. So this is his, all his collection about his presentation as how the art in 1980s, that period looks like, yeah. And but all the works made by myself, so this is a fake fabricated, yeah. And this is the performance. Actually, the show, this one is in the originally show in Rubio family collection in Miami, and it's a performance based piece, and um, um, it's called Realism. And I want to discuss about the performance in our space. This. Um, Construction and I'm also a performer. I in the performance I seen, in, seen I was seeing like 20 songs from Teresa Tan, and uh, to have the conversation, the body com language but conversation with the audience who came to the space. Yeah, and the next one, uh, I think this one gonna show in Barbara Pollock's show in Orange County Museum, and this or, uh, this work is also a. Uh, a uh, video piece, but the original picture is from uh, Robert Maybrothop. I selected seven pictures of his, of his original piece and all the lights and all the things according to the original one. And this is one called so The History of Reception, because most of my creation is based on the fake production or the fictional. So this one is, I, I was pretending that I am an art historian. This is my presentation to tell all the audience about my research on an artist who was born in 1950s. And I showed all the evidence to the audience, like the video or the research paper or the other material which made by this artist, but it's, this story is fake because this artist never exists in the world. But I also collected so many references from that period. So yeah, I'm always, I mean, 
discussion discussed about the fake and the real. Where is the truth? And this man is a show in Ukraine, in Kiev, and um, it's called. Uh, I forgot the name, sorry. And um, <laughs> it's about the seven dildos excavated from Eastern Europe. And I found, I, um, the museum helped me to find the actors to play the theater. And this is one called Daddy Project that happened in 2011 in Beijing. And I stand a face on the wall and talk to the public about my father and about my personal life, about how the life goes on as my generation in the, from 1980s to late 1990s and also, and this is one called Art, oh no, this is called Modernist, the Supermodernist and also showing in Ukraine. It's about how we face on the heritage or the, some, gra uh, some grand masterpiece from the modernism sites. Um, and this is a new piece actually happening in this space, and thanks to your curator, Mark, invited me to, to do this. I invited two sinologists from Stanford and UC Arvin, and they, are on the st they were on the stage to debating each other and about a certain case about American white community thinking about the China or the Far Eastern issue could be. So, and, but they, have the real, they, they are the really professors, they are not the actor. So sometimes that face on my practices, I will see like my performance is a radio performance because I never have the really performers participate in my project. I only have the collaborators. I invite them to join my, join my piece. Um, I want to really uh, thank Asian Art Museum and uh, Asia Society for having me here. And without any kind of careful planning, I thought today three of our talk actually weaved um, quite nicely. So um, I think um, I would just start, and I probably will miss a few slides, so uh, I'm freaking nervous right now. <laughs> so in the spirit of uh, 28 Chinese and uh, our upcoming exhibition at the Chinese Culture Center, uh, Present Tense 2015 Future Perfect, I actually want to talk to um, about two artwork that is by an artist that is not in either of the show. Uh, but I think her work is actually very important. Um, her name is Gao Ling, born in 1980s and currently living and works in Shanghai. Her work intersects with design, technology, um, performance, and intervention of the everyday. Um, she came to uh, United States to exhibit with us in 2012. And um, she created this work called Hey Touch Me in 2010 and continued to work on this project till 2013. It's about gender, form, performance, and the um, space and also intervention. But the work took on a very surprised term. Um, but I will talk about her inspiration first. This is an everyday scene in the China subway. Sexual harassment is a common and a serious problem, but normally the way that it was addressed is how women should behave and how they should dress themselves. So this inspired Gao Ling to make the work. She used the um, normal kitchenware to make the metal bra. Um, she made uh, quite a few pairs of them. They're shining, um, uh, they, they stood out, and, um, but she first intended to use it as a statement and only show it in the gallery settings. And this is how the installation looked like. And very few people know about the work and uh, a lot of people probably don't really understand it. So Gao Ling tried to put them to use and uh, she started to um, actually wear them because they are functional. And um, so she invited her friends to try all of them out but then they sneak into the subway uh, almost in midnight so they won't get caught and uh, to wear them as a performance um, and really see how actually they will feel about wearing them by inviting actually the touch called Hey Touch Me. So I invited Gao Ling to join my exhibition in 2011 called Woman, uh, Woman in Shanghai. Uh, it was in conjunction with a conference called Global Chinese Women and Visual Representation, hosted by Fudan University and University of Michigan. I want more people to see the work, and that was the installation view. 
But at the exhibition, I also invited quite a few NGO groups that work on gender and um, uh, gender equity, uh, gender equality and uh, sexual freedom. So Nu Ai, meaning girls love, is one of these groups in Shanghai. And through my exhibition, um, the group and Gaoling got to know each other. But four months later after the exhibition, something happened. So what you're seeing is the, um, a post from the subway authority warning women, when you're dressing like this, you're asking for harassment and girl behave yourself. So you, you can imagine this is exactly what Gaoling and the Shanghai uh, New Eye group do not like. So they come up with the slogan, it's a dress, not a yes. I can be slutty, but you cannot harass me. But look at how they did it. They did it on an iPad because any physical banner and slogan, if, when you're holding it in hands, it will be deemed illegal. And one of the girls is wearing the Hey Touch Me piece, holding the iPad, and then the other girl was covered in a burqa-like rope, and their face are covered to protect their identity. And this is one performance slash protest that was done in response to the Shanghai authority. The instant went viral, and the social network was exploded. Every city except Shanghai did not cover the. Every city in Shanghai, uh, except Shanghai, covered this incident, and Shanghai TV station was not allowed to do this. But BBC and Economist all reported the event and interviewed Gaoling and the organizer. But Gaoling didn't stop there, and shortly for a family issue, she has to move to Beijing, where she found herself breathing the really bad air in 2013. So she started this work called Big Mist that is about environment technology. Um, so this is one of the work. Um, Gaoling issued an open call, inviting everybody, in, everyone uh, around the world to reimagine the air in Beijing and how they should deal with it. And we started to see some amazing images coming out of this project. If you go to Facebook, you're going to see some really cool image like this. And um, to this day, um, I just checked with her yesterday, that were about 300 images from about two, uh, 200 participants from 11 countries. Because of this work, she was also the finalist of the Wing Foundation Master Awards uh, last year under their AIR theme. And that was one of the largest photography awards uh, in the world. So um, uh, some amazing images coming out of this collaboration, and this continues to this day. So if you doesn't matter if you're a photographer or not, you know, she welcomed your image. So these are the kind of work I, myself, as a curator and working at Chinese Culture Center, um, were interested in the um, issues that are relevant not just to the Chinese pe people living in China and beyond, but really in terms of humankind, how we're dealing with these issues. So in that spirit, I would like to invite all of you actually to see this exhibition we're opening this Saturday called Present Tense. Um, six artists um, all in the MFA program um, were chosen from about 60 submissions. And I also would like to announce this amazing upcoming project that the whole city is anticipating that is gonna happen called Skybridge. That's how much I'm going to tell you today, and I hope to see you on July 31st when you witness this moment with me together. So that will be all my presentation today. Thank you. So Barbara kind of started at more the beginnings of what we're calling contemporary art in China. And so I thought we could start with a question for Barbara. Um, and as you've described, there's a lot that's changed within just a few generations of artists, a relatively very a short period of time. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the changes that you've seen in terms of the art infrastructure, and specifically how training has changed between generations. Um, I'm sure you might want to grab oh, your mic. Right. Yeah, there. Though I'm sure everybody here is well aware of this. Sometimes when I talk in the United States, people are surprised to hear that there are very fine art academies in China. And virtually all the artists I know in China 
uh, become artists by going through the art academy. What's interesting is for the older generation, that the generation of artists that emerged in the 90s, they were often the first class of artists admitted to art academies after they reopened after the Cultural Revolution. So they grew up not getting an art education until for like 10 years of their life, they didn't have that experience. And then they went to art academies that were really struggling with whether they were still going to be teaching socialist realist painting um, or not. But they, so many of them had a very traditional training and then got out and wanted to rebel against that. For the younger generation, they are going to art schools that now have new media departments and photography yeah. departments and video departments. And so, and they're exposed via the internet to movements from all over the world. So it's startlingly different backgrounds between mm -hmm. the generations. So, are there, would you say that there are common perspectives on how the younger artists perceive this older generation and vice versa? And, and Yan Cheng, feel free to jump in on this too. I, I'm wondering, I mean, we hear the, uh, many of the same names over and over and over, and certainly there was a, much, there was a very broad landscape that was happening in China with, among that first generation. But how, how would this, this current generation, these you know, 1980s born artists, how do they perceive that earlier group? And any, anything that you've noticed? Well, there's a couple of thing, criticisms that have come up in informal conversations. Um, often they tell me they don't want to be Zhang Zhaogang using that specific artist today, meaning that they don't want to spend a career making the same looking painting over and over and over again. And there's some criticism of the older generation of being overproductive. Um, and I see younger generation wanting much more to be experimental, change styles frequently, rather than just have one iconic look. Um, and repeat that again and again. So, uh, Yan Ching, so looking at your work, it might be surprising for some people that you studied oil painting in art school. And so I'm wondering, did experimental practices factor into your, tr your school experience? And um, were these practices encouraged or discouraged? What was your experience? Uh, I think all the art education in China is refers or copied from the Soviet period. So actually, we don't have the fine arts department, department so far. And so if you want to be a fine art artist, I mean, use the multimedia or you can choose whatever you want, the, the, the mixed media materials, you have to choose like um, oil painting or sculpture department or print marketing department. Or you could choose a Chinese paintings like the independent department. And as Barbara mentioned, Zhang Xiaogang actually is a professor and my oil painting department in Sichuan Fine Arts Institute. And that's true, I don't want to be him. <laughs> and uh, I think my school, the Sichuan Fine Arts Institute, the Chuan Mei, it is one of the most famous school training the artists who get the big success in the marketing. Yeah, but... Um, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not part of them, but fortunately, I might be more popular than them right now the internet, in, the, in, in the global context. So I think I, I was born in that uh, department, but when I was at the uh, second year or the third year, I was um, start the interests about um, something else, maybe beyond the painting, maybe beyond the, but you know, we all be, Training by this traditional socialism or the Soviets, is these paintings, yeah. So still, that's part of the training. Oh yeah, it is absolutely. Even right now, if you are the Chinese students in the art academy, they still take the same case, take same course. I think it's totally the same, yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, in, we're in the Asian Art Museum, which is a primarily a collection of traditional art. So, you know. Among the 28 artists, there are clearly some artists that are you know, directly engaging with Chinese traditions, 
kind of back to the origins of Chinese art, whether it's coll through calligraphy or through, um, you know, reworking old styles um, in sometimes in a critical way, sometimes not. And so I wonder, I mean, Barbara, you said that the early generation was kind of rooted in the Chinese experience, but how did tradition or factor into that? Was it a part of, was it a part of that conversation as you see it? I, I, wait, I just need you to clarify. That's yeah. a really big question. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> so what I'm asking is, given China's rich, rich, diverse artistic traditions, you know, it, this with this earlier generation, was there an, a, a rupture with that tradi tradition in any way, or is it still present? Or and, and how does uh, thinking about tradition factor into these more experimental practices? Um, I think that um, there, there actually is as many different reactions to that question as there are Chinese artists. Right. Yeah. Um, there isn't only one way that Chinese artists engage with tradition. But I think the more interesting issue is that for the artists I met in the, from the, emerging from the 1990s, it was very important to them that their work um, spoke of a Chinese identity. So they would refer to the traditions as a way of putting a kind of specific identity onto the artwork. It was very important to them that if you walked into the room, you could tell from across the room that was made by a Chinese artist. Whereas for the younger generation, that's the last thing they want their work to speak of. They may use tradition, they may even refer to tradition, but they don't, their concern is not about being a Chinese artist as much anymore. Which I think is refreshing, right? It opens up the landscape in diverse ways. It allows for other, you know, other conversations to enter into this question of, you know, art, a, a more diverse art production, right? So, Yan Qing, so you're in Los Angeles now. And so, well, you were here a few months ago. We had a brief conversation and about your experience of being in Los Angeles and kind of looking back at China. And I wondered if you could share a little bit about that. What, what do you think American audiences, or maybe I should say West Coast audiences, are missing or... How, how anything that surprised you? Uh, actually, I think in the very beginning, as my career started, and I'm in the show internationally. So before I came to Los Angeles, all my show is based in the States and the Europe. So I never think about the travel, change the location, gonna be a big issue or the big problem for me. And refer to the last question as Barbara answered about the traditional, as Edison, you said the traditional. I'm always thinking about I was born in China and I be, I've never taken any further education abroad. I, I mean, totally I'm a Chinese guy and have a Chinese passport. But so what's the traditional as the Chinese should be or the audience expect the Chinese could be. So this is always a question in myself, but I think for me, I really don't care about what's the Asian cultural or the traditional or the Chinese traditional, because I think my job is being an artist. My job is refers to my professional. The traditional is in my professional, like my works with references to different existing works of the artists in the, in the art history could be in Korea, could be in America, could be in Europe. I'm, I'm totally open-minded and that's my tradition. And I don't want to lock myself or limit myself to just uh, express uh, calligraphy in painting, which really, I really, I really couldn't understand that. But I know that's the only thing right now in America the audience may be interesting about that, but I think this is the post-colonial consequences because um, maybe they think it's, uh, this is the things from the orientalism, they feel that's interesting, even they have no idea about what's, right, what's going on right now in China, or what uh, young people right now they are doing in China. So they are just to have the, what I call it, I don't want to call it imagination, I call it illusion from the American audience. Now. So I think this show, the Rubio show, this show, and some shows right now is coming out in American, like, in, like Barbara's show also. I think it's quite different as in the past because really involved the artists from the different generation, different subject, different con 
concentration. So this is quite different, yeah. So Abby, I mean, your work at the Chinese Cultural Center has done, has opened up um, conversations around identity in kind of a transnational way. And I think that Gaoling uh, is a great example of, you know, her work is, is not talking about a specifically Chinese phenomenon, right? Although it is still linked to local conversations. What, and I, you know, I was reading that uh, incredible review in Yishu about women, the, uh, the exhibition that um, Gaoling's work was a part of, that Abby curated, and what struck me was that that exhibition was originally in, in Shanghai in 2012, is that right? Uh, 2011. 2011. And that really the, the feminism in general was kind of a blind spot to this Chinese contemporary art. And I was thinking a little bit about why that, why that was. And immediately I, what I started thinking was, well, you know, a lot of what the artists that have the most visibility here are linked to kind of market phenomena, right? And maybe these artists that are dealing with issues like f feminism don't have that type of commercialism. And so therefore they're kind of removed from the conversation. So I wondered what your perspective is on that because I know there are many important female artists. So why are we not hearing about their work? Well, <laughs> that is a multi-layered question and uh, comment. Um, so I'm gonna try my best to address that. Um, market is one issue, uh, feminism is one issue, and then the other one is about location, right? So I'll try to f start from the back. Um, you can't really talk about feminism without talking about activism. And this is very similar um, to what happened to feminism in the 1960s around the world at the time, except for China. So I think today China is living in that era. Um, I took a recent trip back to China, and the day I arrived in Shanghai was the day the five feminist uh, activists were released. Um, they were um, under arrest for uh, quite a few days and on the final day that they have to press charges and they were released. And if you go online to try to see Shanghai Nui's microblog, at the time, as I said, it was exploding uh, in the internet about what they have done. And right now, they all got deleted. Some um, by themselves, just to protect the identity of the participants, and some were just deleted by the government, right? So that is one issue, is you can't talk about feminism without talking about activism, and any kind, form of organizing is such a difficult task, and that's why, you know, women as a vision, the NGO, the underground NGOs groups were invited because how creative they are in operating. They can't get a license, and then the issue they talk about is such a, I mean, it's just such a, I mean, gender equality and sexuality, it's such a personal issue, but then it have to make it into an activism issue. Um, so that's one thing. So they're kind of like away from the market thing, uh, but then they're super relevant. But um, I know that Barbara recently also wrote an article about, you know, talking about China, China's women artists and the Guerrilla Girls, right, doing a... a a quick comparison. So, um, and in terms of the local and transnational, um, I think visual language wise, I, th I think Barbara referred to it and also Yanxing mentioned about that as well. The newer generation um, actually is less, I would say, concerned about that iconic or kind of like a visual, visual signifier about what their identity is. But if you look at Gaoling's work, uh, whether it's about the Hey Touch Me or Big Mist, they all grounded very much in the place that she was living in, whether it's a subway or the air that she was breathing. But um, she was grounded in there, but as a point of departure. And then in the activism, um, in the performance slash protest that they did, did in Shanghai, not only they were wearing the metal bra, but at the same time covered in that burqa-like robe. It's almost transnational and really addressed these kind of issues on so many different levels. 
Um, and then the air one, you know, it, it got extended and invited imagination about what breathing the air means is such a fundamental thing. But then um, what I really found fascinating for the new generation is that they started to inject so much humor into their work. And as, as you, you're seeing the previous generation, the way they do is really about trauma, you know, um, whether it was um, Zhang Xiaogang's work or, um, you know, uh, even Zhang Huan's work about endurance, you know, and then, so a lot of them is really about this traumatized experience. But as you get into the younger generation, a lot more lighter, you know, Gaolin has a lot of sense of humor in her work. Uh, so in that sense, I, I think that is a huge difference that I'm witnessing. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, working on 28 Chinese, you know, having two out of 28 be women artists was a troubling aspect of, the, of this project and one that I had a chance to discuss with the Rubels. I mean, this is a, a, these artists were selected by them and they said that they worked very hard to find, to visit more female stu st studios of female artists, and that ultimately they had to stay true to their practice of f purchasing these works of artists that they connected with. I just, it, it's so surprising to me. And Barbara, I'm so glad you mentioned that your exhibition has, that it was easy to have 50-50 split. The thing that's really interesting is if you, do, if you do your research just by going to galleries in Beijing and Shanghai, you will, have, you will come up with very few women artists. Yeah, you know, I did a little experiment just to kind of work through this issue myself, and I, did also, I also found that phenomenon to be true. Um, and so where, where are these women, it, what's happening? Yeah. That's why an are excellent these question. Why, um, what's up with the galleries, right? Yeah, what's up with the gallery? Yeah. I asked that question to quite a few gallery owners, um, and I was like, why, why don't you guys have some women artists? And this is a very honest answer, and I, I, was, I really appreciate you know, how genuinely he answered it. He was like, you know, we tried women artists before, but you know, they, they get married, they get divorced, they got kids. Any of these reasons could be the reason they stop making work. I was thinking, well, that could easily happen to a male artist too. If they get married, they got divorced or whatever. But um, I think that the general uh, perception about that is um, women artists are not bankable. Um, they're not worth the investing, which I think it's actually really worth investing if we talk about from the market standpoint. Um, you look at how Lee Kreisner, you know, Georgia O'Keeffe, the way that they were performing, even though I'm not a market expert, but I mean, they're missing 50% of the population. And important work just now, you know, we're talking about. And this might be a good moment to mention that um, Fang Lu, one of the, w I think one of the, the most exciting artists among the 28. I've really fallen in love with her work. She's going to be coming to screen another project on the 18th next week. And it's really um, not just because she happens to be a woman, but her work's really incredible. And I would recommend that you come back to um, be a part of that screening. But um, so, Abby, I mean, it seems like there's a certain aspect of... Gowling's project and then the extended kind of activism part of it that being a little bit under the radar allowed for the success of the project, right? Which brings me to the question that comes up any time we talk about contemporary art in China, which is censorship. I think that for many Americans, like an, an awareness of contemporary art in China has to, it's filtered through this mass media coverage of censorship you know, kind of probably also leading to this misunderstanding that most of art coming out of China is political. So I guess, Barbara, I'll start by asking you, how do the artists that you've spoken with and interacted with experience censorship and continue to be a creative 
given that the presence of that phenomenon there? I, I have to be very honest. Most of the artists I know in China have very rarely encountered censorship. And they view it as something that happens, that will happen inevitably for some very arbitrary reason, so it's not worth tailoring their art making around that. I also think that um, there are areas of Chinese society that are much more heavily censored than contemporary art. The internet is much more closely controlled. Movies, the television, these reach vast audiences. Contemporary art really doesn't reach that big an audience. So the government is not that worried about something taking place in a commercial gallery, for example. Whereas at a state museum, that would be very closely watched. So Yan Ching, is this something that you think about at all? Uh, yeah. I think, I think whenever time I travel abroad, the most concerning from the outsider is about the censorship in China. But I have to say, as my own experience, of course there is a censorship in China, but I know how to operate the internet. We have some, have some software, so you could easily to cross the great firewall, and I think all the young generation, we know how to use it. It is like uh, you turn on your computer or turn off your computer. You can choose it. So for us, even there is a censorship, but how it has really influenced us, I don't know. I mean, look at my work. I don't think there is a censorship in, in China when I was very young, so till now. But um, I think I know most of the things as American young people know. So. This is quite interesting. I mean, but this quite, the, 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 about the censorship is so complicated. There is another censor, I think it's more um, danger than the censorship on the internet is our self-censors. So when we talk about China, why we automatically selected something all related to the politic. Maybe American people all already be censored by the mentality from the environment here, then you selected something, not you, I mean, the most of the Mar American audience would love to enjoy the artist who is a political artist because there is another censor who knows, maybe the politics everywhere. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting twist because I think we'd all agree that most Americans have a particularly narrow view of art outside of America, right? <laughs> so, um, so uh, we'll open it up to some questions, but just one more question for Abby about your project when it was presented in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. I know that there was a conference associated with it. Was there a difference in the reception of the conference as opposed to the artwork component, the exhibition? Huge. Um, actually, the uh, conference was sent, uh, had actually two national security uh, officers sitting throughout the entire conference. And I was very kind of worried that the exhibition might get shut down. That was my first ever project in China. And they do this all the time, sometimes that they shut down on the day you open. So, so that is really, for me, a very hor horrible thing that will happen to all the artists. But um, I agree with Barbara. Actually, contemporary art, or generally art, provide a little bit more breathing room. I can't say it's freedom, but more breathing room for actually activism. The reason why they were holding the iPad um, is actually to get away from protest and call it an art performance. And you can get away with it when you say it's a performance instead of a protest. So art, in a way, provides this kind of neutral safety zone for lots of activism that is happening, which is great in my mind. That's interesting. OK, any questions from all of you? Hi, uh, thank you. I'm actually visiting from New York. I'm an art student in New York, and I also interned in Asian Society and MoMA in New York. So I have two questions. One is for Barbara. Is considering there are so many emerging art museums right now and young collectors like Liu Yitian and Lin Han in recent years, and what do you think the role of Chinese art institution in the modern Chinese art scene right now? And one is for Abby, and uh, um, I think uh, think about Gaoling's work as the socially engaged art piece for me. And uh, what do you think is the possibility or capacity of socially engaged art project in modern China right now? Thank you. 
There is an enormous collector class going on in China. And every collector I know in China is building a museum. So, for example, in Shanghai, there are eight contemporary art museums right now, which most of the time are empty of people, but they have the museum. These museums don't have curators and don't have collections, but the building is often built, a huge building by a star architect. Um, so this is happening in every city in China. I um, think, and then the younger collectors are very interesting because they're putting together international collections in like one year um, at startlingly fast rates. And you see them all over the galleries in New York now. And it's like, I call it instant art history. It's like putting together, um, you didn't know anything about Western contemporary art two years ago, and now you're opening a museum of an international collection overnight. And so I think what's gonna be really interesting is to figure out how quality control can emerge in Chinese society. Um, right now, I don't think the critics are strong enough, but there's like no counterbalance to this. So that's something I'm very curious to see how that will develop. Um, actually, when you look at Gao Ling's work, I don't think she think herself as a social engaged kind of artist. I think she's just really consider herself as a artist that intersects her work with design, technology, you know, and that kind of thing. And but if you see the development of that thing, you know, they, they, the artist and the NGO met, and then organically something happened. I think that's the best form. A lot of times when I think the artists, when they're really kind of contriving and try to make a social engagement work, a lot of times those works are just horrible. And a lot of times it's kind of like a propaganda piece, you know? Um, so even when I was working with the NGOs, uh, other NGOs saw how successful this event was and asked like, okay, how, they can work with an artist, and I always hesitant to to continue the conversation because I, I really worry about art being used as a propaganda piece um, unless it's happened like this kind of organically. Um, in terms of socially engaged work that happened organically, I think there are still quite a lot. Uh, particularly, uh, I started to see the emerging independent institutions in China. They're small uh, in Guangzhou and in Beijing and even in Shanghai, but they're happening. So I'm, I'm quite confident about that. Hi, I'm also a visual artist from the Philippines and I have a question for you again about the art market. Do you see, there was this period when they thought that art was being made for export, you know, during the 80s and 90s. And do you see a difference between the type of art that foreign collectors are buying or the U.S. market is buying versus what the local artists are buying? Because in the Philippines, I do see that. Um, that's a very complicated question when it comes to China because all of the artists, the artists that emerged in the West before there was a market in China that got really famous and are selling for millions are also highly desired by Chinese collectors because they want to have famous artists in their collections. At the same time, there are certain genres of art making, like contemporary ink painting or realist painting that are very popular in China that have no, Westerners have no interest in. But it's way more complicated than East versus West now. Um, because the collectors are traveling all over the world, the artists are traveling all over the world, and the auctions are taking place all over the world. So it's, it's, a, it's much more complicated than in China, outside of China right now. I'm a Chinese-American artist. And I was wondering how you thought the overseas Chinese community artists intersected with the Chinese artists, since the present tense show is pretty much about that. So I guess there might be a connection in the globalization of, of both identities. Well, thank you, Jessica, for the wonderful question for me to brag about present tense again. Actually, 
<laughs> uh, when you mentioned about Fang Lu, uh, Fang Lu was a present tense 2009 artist, and um, um, more and more we're seeing artists that working transnationally, Yanxing yourself being one. And um, I know Jessica, you go to China teach all the time. So uh, location wise, it's no longer kind of like that restricted. Um, personal mobility has definitely changed that landscape quite a lot. Um, but personally, the way I look at it, I think the artist producing work in China is relevant. And so are the diaspora Chinese artists. Um, their work are super relevant as well. And I feel like the diaspora artists, um, regardless whether they are Asian or African, that they're often overlooked in their own country by the mainstream. And also they are overlooked by their own native country are seen. So in a way, I feel like this group of artists, first, first of all, got tremendous potential. And secondly, that their point of view and their perspective are re uh, very refreshing to see on the block. And not, really not to brag about present tense or, 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 or some of these shows out there, but I really think that um, the world needs to see something that is, doesn't necessarily always at the forefront. Um, whether it's about market or museum or something. I'm always interested in something that's kind of hiding and require our curiosity to explore and discover. Um, so I personally have the strong belief in diaspora artists. Um, and then I, I really think that's an overlooked area, Re you know, whether it's in the art critic field or the um, market or whatever, but I do think diaspora artists is more complicated for people to talk about and understand. So that's why it's a, you know, it's, it's a tough area. And all I wanted to add to that is it's really funny because my next project is an exhibition called WeChat, that the only requirement was that the artist was on WeChat, which made it that I could then include Chinese artists that are living in New York, and Chinese artists living in Beijing or Shanghai, but I'm, I've just begun getting very interested in this is, issue of diaspora artists. And I, you were just recommended to me, so we'll have to figure that one out. <laughs> this is a question for Yen Xing. Could you talk a little bit about performance art in China and um, also maybe um, talk a little bit about gay, transgendered, you know, uh, artists. Oh, I realized several projects in China, which is performatic based and also per performed in some other venues in all over the world. And, uh, and uh, you, you want to ask, is it a problem if a performance work, uh, artist work in China? I guess I want to, I, I just want to hear from you kind of what the shape or the, the, um, the young generation's work in performance art, kind of what does, what does that look like in Oh China? yeah, we have several like the art keys which I really like actually like, um, but this question is complicated because how, it depends on how you define the performance artist or, <laughs> I don't know, I think like Fang Lu for my way and he, she, her practice is quite performance but maybe maybe we think she's more video artist more, but so this definition is category also right now need to be updates because right now we are living in the transaction period. Everything goes too fast. We need some time to reform it. it so, and for some other Chinese artists like Hu Xiangqian, who Barbara mentioned that he, he is really extraordinary. I like him so much and, uh, and uh, yeah. And I don't think if you are the performance artist that you, you are doing your job, you're gonna take some problems. I never take any problems, even be the gay in China, no problems. So f refer to this f female artist in 28 Chinese, I think this is another most, um, most sad thing, is there only one gay artist in the show, right? <laughs> yeah, so, but I wanna, yeah, I wanna see in, in China be the, be the gay, even you're the artist, really no problem. Nobody will care about it. I mean, at least I don't care about it. I care about the quality of the work, right? It's not just because you are gay, then you have to be, be, 
be how you call that them zuo bi. <laughs> well, for your generation, though, I think for the previous generation, it's a lot harder for them to、um, open up about their sexuality. Oh yeah,、say. definitely. I think so. But for me, I never experienced that. So for me, it's 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 fine. <laughs> He is the only gay artist in China that says it's fine being gay in China. I just have to say that, you know. <laughs> And there, in in the show, my generation, I will tell you,、um, on first glance, I thought there were many gay artists in my show, but then most of them told me, "Oh, but I'm married," <laughs> because that is, you know. But no, no, no. I don't mean married to.、Uh, yeah. But I think you know, as I remember, as my first performance piece, we, which I mentioned in the in the、uh, in the presentation, is called Daddy Project. I faced on our gallery in Beijing and take a one-hour narrative presentation about what happened in my life and how I became gay. And、uh, but there's so many other st-、uh, narrative stories linked linked each other. And、uh, I don't think it's a problem. Do you think it's a problem? <laughs> I think it might become an issue when you get more mainstream, particularly on CCTV. That probably become will become a problem.、Uh, for example, like Coco Zhao,、uh, who is a jazz singer, great singer, but sh- he's also open gay. And then so、um, for several times at the national sort of television, he was just about to already include it, but he got cut right before he get on the stage.、Mm-hmm. And then. Yi Go Ho in Guangzhou, who is a dancer, also openly gay, and and so he he can't really do like large like government sort of like a lead dancer,、yeah. so he has to do independent、yeah. dancing. I think for me, I never participate any gay activities or the social networks in when I was in Beijing even. And for me, I think I'm more concentrated about being an artist, but I am gay, and I don't want to go be part of like the gay community to. To, I mean, I mean, I don't care if there is an occasion. I would love to be part of them, but、um, but there is no maybe in the future. <laughs> no. Okay.、Um, well, I'm going to thank our panelists and thank you all for coming.